Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Counterpoint, a musician's tale. And we're happy to have all along the Armstrong Network tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Larkin Poe. Black Betty had a child, Bambalam, the damn thing go out. Bambalam, a woo out of my mind, Bambalam, the damn thing go out. Bambalam, whoa, Black Betty, whoa, Black Betty, jump steady, Black Betty, jump steady, Black Betty now. Hey! Whoa, Black Betty, Bambalam, whoa, Black Betty, Bambalam, she really gets me high, Bambalam, you know that's no lie. Bambalam, she's so rock steady, Bambalam, she's always ready, Bambalam, whoa. goodness that's what I'm talking about that's what I am talking about ladies and gentlemen that's Rebecca Hi. this is Megan over here hello and uh, they took the name for their band from their great 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 grandfather yep and his name was Larkin Poe yeah Larkin Haskew Poe very southern Haskew Haskew and you are in somehow a family tree of Edgar Allan Poe? So Larkin Poe was Edgar Allan's cousin. Really? Yeah. And could your great-great-grandfather, could he write also? Did he do you know, any? I, I, I can't say that we have any literaries in our family. But interestingly, um, there's, there stands the Poe family cabin in Chickamauga, Georgia, which is just north of where we grew up. And that's where the Chickamauga, uh, Chickamauga battle took place. And so he ended up acting as a historian, Larkin Poe. Once the battle went through, people came to him since his home was literally in the middle of the fight. And I asked him to report and write. So he, in that way, he was a historian, which I think. I like that. Yeah, that that's writer. That's, that's a writer cool. for sure. Yeah. I, I, hopefully he embellished on things, too, back then. Made it a exactly. little bit better. Um, so Larkin Poe. You guys got together and took this name just uh, it's not been that long. I guess it's been since 2010. So mm -hmm. it's been a minute, but it doesn't feel like that long. <laughs> You've been doing music for a lot longer than that. Yeah. We were very fortunate to grow up in a music-loving family. So our mother and our father put us in uh, classical violin and piano lessons as little kids. Classical violin and piano. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you both 
you mm-hmm. play oh, and and guitar yeah. and a little drum mm-hmm. and what else? Um, let's throw, see. throw them out. So what? I started violin. I was three. Megan was four, and then came piano for us both. And then I went to banjo and mandolin. Yeah, we got bit by the bluegrass bug. We went yeah. to a bluegrass festival in our early teens. We were just blown away, so we just quit our cra- classical lessons. <laughs> and went to bluegrass. And picked yeah. a banjo. Our <laughs> teachers were incensed. They were like, what are you doing? <laughs> but yeah, I picked up banjo and mandolin. Megan kind of fiddled around with a bunch of different things until she found the dobro, and then it really mm. clicked, which is like the acoustic version of what she plays now. And how old were you when this bluegrass... Fever hit you. 14, 14, 15. 15. Yeah. Were you going to become the Carter family? Actually, we ended up touring as the Level Sisters. That was our band name. And we were doing it just as a hobby. We would go around to different festivals. Because, I mean, in Georgia and Tennessee, obviously, there's a lot of porch pickings and hoot nannies and things that take place. So we would go around and play the Little Mountain Opry's um, for fun. And, and that was with our eldest sister as well, because there's three of us girls that originally were in the band. And then we killed our eldest sister and started Larkin Poe. And... <laughs> Uh, Wait, no. where, where, what happened with your other sister? She, she, had, she, she had actually moved brain. on and started a life away from music. She, she got a real brain. job, no. girls. Is that what happened? No. Yeah. She was like, oh, this is such a weird, it's a weird way to try and make a living. And so she decided to, to move on after about five years. I mean, because we actually got to do a lot of cool touring as the Level Sisters. Um, our first gig, like official gig ever, was on... Garrison Keillor's a Prairie Home Companion. I don't know if y'all remember, he does the 12 to 20 competition. So in 2005, yours truly plus sister, um, we went on the show and we ended up winning that competition. And people assumed that we were like a legit band and, and we were just kind of <laughs> doing it for fun. And then all of a sudden we had promoters coming out of the woodwork, like wanting to book gigs for us. And so we started touring in the family minivan, like <laughs> pretty much full time the first year. On. Yeah. And, and, or mom and dad a part of it? Were they driving you? They never your... played, but they were very supportive. They allowed us to do it. Uh huh. I think and we were homeschooled from the ground up, so we just took our school in the car and and, and they did travel with us yeah. in the beginning since we were so young. Yes. Yeah. But they're I, both doctors, so I think it was quite a surprise that they ended up having kids that have. Your mom, kids. mom and dad are both doctors. Mm-hmm. What kind? Father's a pathologist, and our mother um, was an occupational therapist. And they were okay with you guys just going full-time into music? I think that they had very broad um, standards for what qualified as a hobby. You know uh-huh. what I mean? And they were like, okay, well, this is, this is a really good hobby. It's not your job. Yes, yes. It's you're going to your get over this stuff in a hurry here. Exactly. Yeah. And then suddenly here we are. But later on, they saw how passionate we were about mm-hmm. it and that we really work hard. And so I think that that's what they were like, you know, whatever you're going to choose, go for it wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were very supportive in that way. I came across um, Larkin Poe's album, Peach. And I'm telling everybody that's watching, everybody in the studio audience, it was my pick for album of the year. Oh, I, I, and half originals, mm-hmm. half covers. You guys opened up with a song called Black Betty. Everybody knows it from Ram Jam. But the original version was done by Lead Belly Lead back Belly. in the 30s. You know, and... That's what I love about this album is you are bringing back a lot of music that people might have forgotten about or maybe gives them a chance to go rediscover. Was that a part of it? I mean, was that was your plan? Yeah. I mean, having grown up in the South, um, being hugely influenced by the source music of the South and the source music of American music at its core, that was a huge touchstone for us. I mean, because we grew up listening to Southern rock, like our dad, while our mom was towing us around in the minivan listening to classical baby Mozart tapes. Our dad was spinning, you know, Allman Brothers and um, Thin Lizzy and a bunch of, like, Southern rock bands. So we'd always grown up listening to blues-influenced rock. Um, and it wasn't until the last, like, maybe four or five years that we actually went back and started to educate ourselves on, you know, traditional blues, Delta blues, Hill Country blues, um, all the different disciplines and really understanding the impact that that music has had on all music in the world. Everything begins yeah. there, doesn't it? Everything begins. Yeah. When I go and talk to schools, uh, colleges, kids, I tell them anything they're listening to began with the blues. And they mm-hmm. kind of look at you like, uh, what are you talking but about? But it is true. It is, it is very true. Let's do another song yeah. off of Peach. Um, I, was, I was hoping that you might rip into preaching blues here. Sure. Yeah. 
You want to talk a little bit about this one? What do you know about the background oh, of this one? Man. So one of our shared loves for, for blues artists would be Sun House. Mm -hmm. This is a Sun House tune. And we originally heard his version, and, and I was bowled over by the relevance of the lyric because it's incredibly snarky. And this is a song that was written you know, almost 100 years ago. Yes. And, and the level of snark that this guy was employing in his lyric was just, to me, like, addictive. And we wanted to do our own version of it. Robert Sun House was the gentleman who first did it. And if you know anything about Sun House, what he did was let the world know that Robert Johnson didn't actually um, lay down his guitar and make a deal with the devil. Uh, Sun House went out and told people, you know what Robert Johnson did? He went and practiced his guitar, which is a really boring story. Nobody wanted to hear that, <laughs> that it was better that he made a deal with the devil than actually practiced. And as you can can tell these young ladies have practiced here that they're doing sun house and this is called preaching blues <laughs> Your soul, 
<laughs> Sid, Sid. Oh, that Larkin Poe. Yeah, Sisters of the Brotherhood. It was Derek Trucks of the Allman Brothers Band who is kind of getting credited with calling you guys the little sisters of the Allman Brothers. And we love that. That's, a, that's such a huge thing for us. We grew up listening to him, like she was saying, and... It's just, yeah, to be the little sisters of the Allman Brothers, that really fits for us. I think it is just a tremendous, because you're, you're, you're carrying on a tradition that is so important. It's, it's so extremely important because nothing against pop music nowadays, but they kind of lost where everything came from, and you guys are keeping that going out there. Well, thank you. I mean, I do think that there is a resurgence um, from what we can feel in people seeking out music that has a lot more substance. And that is very refreshing for us. I mean, having grown up, not necessarily listening to a whole lot of pop music. I mean, we were bluegrass kids for crying out loud. Like yeah. we were the anti-hip, you know, like the anti-Christ of. But I, I think that served us really well because it, I, I do think that our, our parents were spinning these records that informed and expanded, you know, the musical boundaries that we're able to appreciate now and employ when we're writing our own music and hopefully inspiring a new generation of people to pick up guitars. And like you said, not that there's anything wrong with pop music. Exactly. Oh, because exactly. everybody loves it. Not that there's we anything wrong with it, it. yes. Um, but you just, you don't want to lose the other as well. Yeah. I uh, was lucky enough to interview Warren Haynes recently, Ooh. and uh, we were talking blues. And everything, to me, the story automatically goes to blues. But um, he started talking about it in a way that kind of led us down the same path. And I'm saying the ladies are carrying the torch nowadays. And Anna Popovich, Susan Tedeschi, mm -hmm. Beth Hart, Sue Foley, Samantha Fish, Larkin Poe. What is it with white girls playing the blues? <laughs> Where did this, where, and you guys are really, really carrying the torch. I actually, we've never been asked this. I have no idea. I think it's probably just because for so many years, we didn't. I mean, the number of, of male blues guitarists mm -hmm. far outshines that of women. And it's not for a lack of proficiency, I think it's, or ability, you know. I think it's more just what's been modeled. I think that so oftentimes, Little girls grow up looking at, and rightly so, like a Beyonce or a, or a Pink or a, a Lady Diva character who isn't necessarily playing the guitar. And I think that's such a, such a tragedy in a way. Like, you want to have all groups represented. So for us, I think the blues has spoken to us, and we've heeded the call. <laughs> yeah. Where, where do you see the future I mean, um, have you ever thought about that? In, you know, in like, what way? where do you where do you want to be like three, four, five years from now? I mean, uh, still doing what you're doing, the way you're doing it. Do you want to add add more individuals to the band? Do you want to get bigger, or don't you don't you even worry about that? You just kind of live in the moment. It's it's a combination of both. I think that sometimes you can um, be paralyzed by possibility if you think too much in the future. Wow, paralyzed but, by possibility. Yeah, that's that's my like. That is awesome. Thanks. I need that on a T-shirt. It's true. You can't be. You cannot yeah. allow it. So you got to live in the, you got to try to be in the present. But just, I guess it was, oh, this is weird to say, like three days ago, we were in Los Angeles. And um, Jimmy Vivino, who fronts the band for Conan's TV show, he had invited us to come out and be a part of this amazing benefit concert in Los Angeles that was benefiting both Americana and the blues, kind of the relationship and the marriage between the two. And it was Bob Weir and Shemnika Copeland. Oh, Lucinda was on that, wasn't she? Lucinda was on oh. that. Oh. John it Prine. Was John Prine. It was an amazing lineup. And we actually got to play, the two of us, in front of Jimmy and the house band. And there was a B3 player. And I, I, when we're talking about the future, I would Whew. love to have a B3 player on stage. That would Definitely. be powerful. <laughs> but honestly, I would see us doing what we're doing because we love what we're doing. Uh -huh. And we've been independent our entire career, pretty much. Um, and, and that has been... I think really empowering for us as artists because you're then driven to make all the decisions and in that way I think that our fans are getting a very true representation of who we are as people and you know what our souls sound like because we are making the majority of the decisions creatively and business wise and we like that so I, I certainly would see us trying to maintain that locus of control moving forward for sure we're not control freaks are we not at all not at all <laughs> it seems to me like 
you guys aren't going to listen to a lot of orders from the outside anyway. Just just saying. You know the Ramones jackets kind of give it away. It's like, you know, we're kind of in we're kind of in charge. Back kids yeah. on the block. Yeah. Yeah. We're very lucky to have a super supportive team. I'm not making it sound like we do everything. Like we have a great manager, a great agent. But they're all very supportive of us, you know, being the very tippy front point of the spear, which we thoroughly appreciate. We're going to play uh, a brand new track that you guys have coming out here real quick. But um, I want to talk about when I first saw you was 2015 in Memphis and Elvis Costello was doing an acoustic show, and which is very, very hard to do to begin with. And he and you opened and then you come out and you play with Elvis. Elvis is, to me, a musician's musician. It seems to me like everything has got to be precise with Elvis Costello. Is, mm -hmm. is, is that true? This is so true. I would say, actually, Elvis Costello is, outside of just being a massive songwriter, amazing performer, one of the most iconic voices there has ever been. He is a music historian, and I think that yeah, a lot that's it. of our, you know, the impetus to get us researching deeper into music and understanding music history came directly from him. Because we would sit in catering with him, and he would talk about, oh, well, do you know this artist and this artist, and this artist influenced this artist, and we're talking about, you know, back in the 30s and the 40s, and that was hugely inspiring for He's us. He's a deep well of knowledge. That yes, man. he is. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not going to um, kind of scam him when it comes to being... Oh, no you know, musically inclined. You better know what you're doing, right? It's true. And we first met him when we were little kids. We were like 17, 18-ish. Um, and he was headlining Merle Fest in North Carolina, which is an amazing Americana Fest. And we were playing one of the little piddly stages. And we ended up, um, as, as is common with Americana Roots festivals, they have big all-star jams. And so he was out jamming on a gospel tune that we knew. And we were like, we know the lyrics. And we went running over and kind of crowded up. And at that point in time, we weren't hugely familiar with who he was. I think if we had been, we wouldn't have had as much guts to go up and just like shoulder in on the mic. Yeah. But uh, we made really good friends. And from that point on, he's been the truest mentor that we could have asked for. He's just really been there for us and taken us under his wing. I think that's such a cool story. And, and one other thing here. Um, I remember when MTV Unplugged started. Oh. And... You know, I think Stevie Ray Vaughan was the very first. But as the years progressed, they were looking for more and more bands to do Unplugged. And the ones who could do Unplugged, you were like, wow, they are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And then you heard other bands and you're like, man, they should continue using a lot of amplification. You know, because all of your little quirks come out. All those little things that you can't cover with noise. Mm -hmm. What's it like always playing like stripped down is it do you ever think about that it's very humbling yeah you got to get it right yeah i think especially we live in this age in which every moment of a show is captured on people's iphones so not only are you getting like a really crappy mix from this <laughs> iphone speaker you know you realize like for us we're a four-piece band and so we're, we're like very stripped back lean mean and and you can really if something goes awry you're gonna hear it and so i think that that requires another level of, of honing the craft. And we're obsessive about rehearsing and, you know, and we want to leave moments free for improv improvisation in the show and like think cool things to happen. But also I think making sure that you have all of your. Yeah. Is making key. it right. <laughs> yeah. Making it right. Um, let's talk about the new album coming out and we're going to play a track off of it. Um, Man, there's no stopping, right? One after another peach is done. And what is coming out now? What is it called? Venom and Faith. Venom and Faith. When your publicist was telling me the name of the new album, Venom and Faith, where did that come from? It's actually a lyric from one of the songs on the record, a song called Honey, Honey. And uh, we wanted to paint a picture of the American South. And naming records is always hard. Yes, we're, it is. We're never like huge fans of key songs on albums because then it's like you put undue pressure on a certain track. But we decided to pull this lyric out of the song, Honey, Honey, because it felt right. And it felt in a way to encompass the different um, emotional realms that we reached with this record, I think. Well, there is a track that's already been released, and it's called Bleach Blonde Bottle Blues. Uh -huh. You got it. You got it. And uh, I just absolutely love this thing. So would you mind? We would oh, love to. All right. This is Bleach 
Blonde Bottle Blues. And it's not even out yet, ladies and gentlemen, so enjoy right here from Larkin Poe. <laughs> you got. I said, ooh, ooh, child, what you gonna do with them bleach long bottle blues? <laughs> Shell pink Cadillac, cherry cola, six pack, the pop and fizz hits you like a hammer. She is turning heads, weapon, great legs, seen her on the big screen. Got nothing on that. I said, ooh, ooh, child, what you gonna do? I said, ooh, ooh, child, what you got? I said, ooh, ooh, child, what you gonna do with them bleach long bottle blues? How you got to Take pity on me. I've been everywhere, seen everything. Now I want to come clean, y'all. I say what I mean. I mean, no, who would just say what you mean? I mean, no, who would just say what you mean? I mean, no, who, child, or what you going to do with them bleach blonde bottle blues? How we got a Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Where'd that come from? You know, we were already in the studio making the record, and we felt that we were missing a certain energy. And so I went home and I had my, um, this crappy arch top from the 30s that I bought off eBay. I mean, it's like falling apart. And I just wrote this song real fast. Megan came over and we tweaked the lyrics together and... And then, like, a few days later, we went and cut it in the studio. So we were glad it showed up for the party. I love the video, too. Dang. I mean, it's, it is so you guys. It, it, where, it, where, did you have the backing track playing, or was that – how did you get it synced up? We did. It was really funny, actually. We made this music video in Nashville. And, and if you drive down, like, on the east side of Nashville, Tennessee, it's just – little strip mall after little strip mall, and, it, and you would never guess, like unless you were looking for it, that there'd be these little dilapidated buildings and little bits of kudzu and trash and barbed wire fences. And so we, we were literally standing like right off a main thoroughfare in East Nashville with a little boom box, like making our video <laughs> and cars are driving by, like, what's going on? I, I really love the way it came out. Thanks. Really, really good stuff. Um, you know, we got to get down to the National Enquirer stuff here, man. This is this is the hard-hitting stuff that you get on uh, Counterpoint, A Musician's <laughs> Tale. I have two daughters of my own, 
and they are thick as thieves. And they have their own language between the two of them. I know a lot of times they're making fun of me. I don't care, okay? So I ask you, being out on the road all of the time, two sisters, you know, probably traveling in a car an awful lot, mm -hmm. I'm going with you first, Megan. What do you hate about Rebecca? Come on. Yeah, I know you've never been asked this before. I love this. Yeah. What do I hate about Rebecca? Yeah. You know, sometimes the thing that And you she hate, probably knows it. The thing that you hate is also the thing you love the most. Mm. Sometimes. Another with phrase her, for a teacher. She is a very take charge person and she is like going to get Done. You know what I mean? And that also can be a little bit hard to follow along with. Sometimes, I just, sometimes I'm going to get on the horse and ride behind her, whether I like it or not. <laughs> oh, God. That's beautiful. Aww. And, and uh, see, uh, there's but the I bond. Also love it. <laughs> that was so nice the way you just cut me down, my sister. Uh, Rebecca, is there anything you don't like about this quiet little thing over here? Oh, she is not quiet. She is, she is full-blooded our grandmother, and our grandmother was one of, like, the toughest ladies I know. This one, she's, she is and will always be my big sister. But I think the thing, again, like you say, one of the things that you love most is also the biggest irritant because we are, like, the early 20s were tough for us because we were coming into our own and embracing the fact that we were very different people. Mm -hmm. And now I feel that we've come more to terms with that and learned how to respect the differences. But I, like Megan says, I'm very like, full speed ahead, let's go, 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 go. No, no, we don't have to be thorough, let's go. Like, run, they're following us, let's go. And Megan is our thorough detail person. And so sometimes her methodicalness, which we thoroughly need, like, <laughs> desperately, because I will just, like, throw a few things in a bag and run. And she's like, no, let's, like, think about what we need to pack. Like, be careful. The voice of reason over here. It's true. And, and it's so interesting because the two things, the things that make us such polar opposites are really the thing that make us a, such a strong team. Like, it's true. I love hearing that you have the, the two daughters that are mm -hmm. really close because we are that way. We're like... Yeah. Oh, you can, you can tell. You can tell. We're very lucky. We're really good friends. And we've learned also, I feel like we've not only been sisters, but it's sort of like a weird marriage slash business slash... A lot of different things layered on top of each other. And we've learned how to, to move through life together without annoying each other too much, which I think is key. I feel like probably somebody who's been married for a long time would know that that's like the biggest thing is what not to do sometimes. Like mm -hmm. learning how to shut your mouth or not do that thing. That would drive them crazy. I'm going to have you back when we do um, the show about relationships. And Ooh. we'll just talk about that. Yes. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit again about the new album when it finally gets out. You're currently working along with Keith Urban. Yeah. And you're doing some shows with Keith Urban. Uh, does this mean that when this album comes out that you're going to continue going that route with him or are you guys going to do your own solo Take, branching off this and going? This summer, yeah. this year's been the craziest year. I know. Been You've been busy. Because, um, when we first went out with them, it, the tour started in June. We thought it was going to be three months, and then we ended up being added for the full tour, so it's been six months. And that's actually almost about to wrap up. It's kind of perfect timing for us because the end of his tour is the beginning of our album cycle. So. Nice. Yeah. So it worked out good. Oh, yeah, it was perfect. Perfect timing. Now, what is an evening like with Keith Urban? It's, it's a really surreal affair. Um, so Kelsey Ballerini opens the show, and then Keith Urban goes on and plays for about 45 minutes. Larkin Poe appears for a stunning six and a half, seven minutes, and then we're done. And then we pop back off. And it's really interesting because at first we were kind of like very thankful for the opportunity. Sure. And also at the same time feeling so weird about it because we're working musicians like we're used to playing hour and a half, two hour shows. Like that's, what, that's, that's our bread and butter, that's what we do. But I feel like for the crowd that, that comes to a Keith Urban show, they would, they would totally not understand what kind of music we are putting across <laughs> on the table. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, he's doing us such a solid by allowing for sure. us to be up on his stage. He's so gracious to let us do a feature. We do like a, a gospel tune and we sing it. 
just a cappella. And then we jam with him on Blacktop, one of his hits from way back when. It's really fun. We have it's a so big, cool. you know, guitar going back and forth. Yeah. Trade and licks, mm -hmm. and he's such an amazing musician. He really is. He's a really incredible guitar player. So. And also, it's fun too because I never play mandolin and Larkin Poe shows anymore. I'm typically just on electric, but I grew up obviously like I was a competition player on the mandolin, and so it's really fun to to get up and I and jam some solos, you know. Like so, it's really been a refreshing experience and so eye opening in so many different ways, you know. Have you ever been to Youngstown before? No, but I, I've wanted step. to because of the Springsteen song. It, 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 there you go. It, well, you also know that we get things done in Youngstown. So mm -hmm. if you need to keep, have you keep Keith Urban off stage for a little bit longer tonight, it can be done in this town. <laughs> we'll just have a All right. We'll just have a, a so if you need, if you need like 15, 20 <laughs> minutes, let me know. I'll make some phone calls. Okay, and we'll just keep. Yeah, okay, we'll just keep Keith in the back there for a little bit, and you'll have to. Um, let's do uh, another song, yes. and I want it to be your choice, ladies' choice. Okay. Megan, what do you feel like doing? Do you, do you guys feel like hearing something upbeat or something soulful? soulful. Something soulful? All right, let's We're do going it. soulful. We're going to do an unrecorded song for you then. And nice. This, this is a song that we wrote with some buddies in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and it's a really tragic love song. This has been so fun. If you want to hurt somebody, oh, it might as well be me. Yeah, if you want to.
I tell you, what I tell you. Mm -hmm. Is it politically incorrect for me to say, I don't like you guys, I love you? Oh, I, I just, I absolutely love your style. I love your sound. I love your personalities. I wish you nothing but the very best. Thank you so and much. it's going to come your way. It already has. It already has. And uh, work on, you know, like some good battles for the future, you know, you can bring back to us. Oh, All right? You can trust us. Their album is called Peach. They have another one coming out called Venom and Faith. Make sure you get them, ladies and gentlemen. This is Larkin Poe, and you've been on Counterpoint, a musician's tale. I'm Cornell Bogdan. Peace. <laughs>